Good evening. So let me introduce my panelists today. Uh, this is a really interesting panel simply because it touches both topical issues, data and privacy. And, and we're going to try to cover it from different industry standpoints. So to my left is Noelle Eder. She's the CIO of Hilton. Harry Mosley, he, he is the CIO of Zoom Communications. And then Andy Osman. He's the CISO of Goldman Sachs. So I want to start off this discussion in the context of you know, just the relevance of big data and uh, companies leveraging more and more machine learning to generate customer insights. How does it help a brand like Hilton? And you know, how do you go about deciding what sort of data to capture? Well, the... Um you know, one of the most interesting things about innovation and technology is that it's usually the removal of constraints in the environment that allow you to do more and more. And so, you know, that's obviously true for, for big data, right? The speed and the scale, you know, sort of compute available to us now uh, dwarfs what used to be true, right? And Hilton is a, a company that uh, prides itself on delivering distinctive, high quality, consistent, even memorable experiences. And so I, I think about that in, in three ways. You know, one is personalization, um, the ability for us to remember and detect patterns about specific behavioral preferences of guests. It might be something as simple as when I travel with my family, I consistently ask for additional hangers and additional towels, but it, it might get more sophisticated than that with IoT capability in the room where you can preset temperature, lights, and even streaming content uh, on the television. So personalization is, is sort of a big focus area for us. Um, the second is, um, you know, sort of cohesive experiences across different touch points. You can think of it as sort of omni-channel engagement, but the idea that a guest can engage in a, in a digital channel, then engage in an analog channel, and, and sort of show up on property with the expectation that what has been done in those various channels holds true on property, whether you've changed the reservation or expect something new or are bringing additional guests, et cetera. So cohesiveness across experiences is a really uh, big focus area for us. And the third is, is contextual relevance. This is where you can bring in outside data to help you elevate the experience. So if you're a traveler whose flight has been delayed, I, I'm not going to share my experience today, but, but if your flight has been delayed and it's pouring rain when you arrive, um, you know, sort of the hotel has that context. If you're departing and it's still raining, which may or may not be true uh, for those of us in New York, um, the hotel can offer you an extended stay or a place to work, right? And so you can think about the amount of data available to us to really personalize the experience potentially to a unit of one. You know, separately, you know, Hilton is a very big global distribution system. So we have a tremendous amount of inventory and we have multiple shelves or channels on which that inventory goes. And so the optimization of inventory and its availability at a precise moment for any particular guest by preference is, uh, you know, of significant value to the customer experience. So those are the kinds of things we focus on. I would imagine my colleagues here, you know, have a similar, you know, sort of set of focus areas, but... Sure, I don't know if you guys want to comment on it, but uh, essentially I think more and more companies, you know, when, when they talk about big data strategy and leveraging AI and machine learning, they have to make a decision in terms of, okay, how do I go about deciding what sort of data to capture, you know, around my customers, and, and obviously they study their customers and then they design their systems accordingly, but is there like a framework that you leverage when it comes to setting up a big data strategy? Well, you know, so there are multiple parts to, to sort of a data strategy, but if we're talking about what data you collect, obviously you want to be very, very, you know, sort of careful. One of the biggest mistakes I've seen companies make, and this is not, you know, a comment on my current company, but just in general, is really just too broadly capturing data and then taking a scarce set of resources, you know, sort of increasingly data engineering and data science are scarce resources and broadly applying them in the environment. So, so that's one of the biggest mistakes I see. You know, I, the framework we use, you know, at a, a pretty high level is you've got to be able to identify the areas of high leverage in your business. Areas that have commercial and, you know, sort of 
monetization, you know, capability affiliated with them that move the needle in a step function sort of way. Um, but those are really just the zip codes, right? And so we've had success with a, a you know, sort of dedicated test and learn type of capability to find the street addresses underneath the, underneath the zip codes. Um, we're pretty focused on, on not wasting um, precious resource on, you know, sort of a broad, a broad program. I found way more success with big data and applying it to very specific problems uh, for which, you know, there's sort of a high leverage um, disproportionate return in the environment. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It's like, you, <coughs> I remember it, not, not at Zoom, but in, in a prior role, in a prior role, uh, one of my uh, partners said, you know, when we were building out our data repository, it's like, well, you know, I, I said we should identify the data that we need. And his response was, no, I want all the data. And I'm like, you know, <coughs> 1,800 applications, you know, variety of different platforms, all the data. Here. Like, I want every piece of data because I don't know what data I want. Well, if you don't know what data you want, then that's the source of the problem. What are you going to use all the data for? Okay. So. Um, so we, we finally figured that out. But, yeah. uh, so, I mean, that's uh, music to my ears, right? <laughs> Information <laughs> security <laughs> officer, I, I come to this. Uh, you know, the, the trite phrase is that data is the new oil. You know, the rebuttal is that data is the new uranium. Um, incredibly valuable, also incredibly toxic and dangerous. Um, I did I, not I, I make that up. I prefer data is the new water, by the way. It makes <laughs> things grow. Uh, but you can drown. Nourish. But you can drown in it. Um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's not dirty and slicky. Oh, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, you know, so from my perspective, you know, every additional piece of data you have is a piece of data you have to secure. Um, and so I'd, I'd much rather we collect what matters and be thoughtful about it. Uh, and, you know, the other thing that I think implicitly came up in your statements is the risks that I worry about come not just from how much and what types of data you collect, but also how many places you put that data. And so, of course, to take advantage of it from a big data perspective, you want to centralize it. That's also what I want from a security perspective. Mm -hmm. So, Harry, coming back to, uh, you know, just capturing more and more data and, you know, uh, applying it in the context of developing a business model. So, SaaS companies are notorious for using a freemium model <laughs> when it comes to, you know, just signing up new subscribers or having somebody try out your service. And, uh, I mean, you guys have done phenomenally well. So. I just wanted to get a sense from you when you uh, give a customer, you know, a sign up a freemium customer, wh what is it that, you know, helps you uh, from that customer in terms of improving the service? What is it that you are doing from a data perspective that's helping you improve the service for everybody? Just yeah, so the, um, in the freemium services, uh, you know, a way for people to experience the Zoom platform. They don't get the full features, they don't get all the capabilities, but they, you know, they get a lot. Um, they get 40 minutes of free service. Um, there's one very large technology company where they've adopted, you know, every meeting has a maximum length of 30 minutes, and they have thousands of people using our platform, which, you know, it's like I remember turning around to Eric and saying this is a problem, and he said, no, this is great, because they're using it with clients and, and they're causing adoption. So you get that viral process going, <coughs> which is great. Um, and then that leads to uh, uh, transactions and opportunities, and uh, so the freemium model is particularly good. We don't, u we don't use that data in any way. Um, we do capture lots of data on, you know, sort of from a device perspective because we want to see, you know, what's the population of iOS, what's the population of Android, what's the population of Windows, operating systems, types of MacBooks being used, and so on and so forth. Why? Because we want to make sure that when we're introducing new features, if iOS is here and Android is here, then on the mobile we'll go with iOS first versus Android. So that type, we, we want to, um, that's how we use the data, but we, you know, um, the fantastic thing, there's many fantastic things about Zoom, but one of the fantastic things is that um, we don't capture, we capture this amount of data in terms of like chat and, you know, contents of chat, but um, when uh, people do a Zoom meeting, it's all transient. It's like everything goes away. We share content. We don't store the content. The content's gone. You know, it's transient through the system, and then, yeah. it, then it's gone. And Thank you. you. Yeah, I <laughs> appreciate and, that. And I'm sure you know. Um,
coming from Goldman, that's a whole other conversation. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, you know it's encrypted in motion and encrypted yep. at rest. And uh, so so Andy, just to piggyback on that comment, uh, uh, are uh, kind of employees allowed to use freemium products uh, when it comes to uh, you know just Goldman in general or? How do you think about you know uh, cybersecurity and data together? Like, is this given there are so many freemium products out there that kind of makes your job tougher? You know, when it comes to just securing the data and keeping the enterprise safe and making sure you know what's going on. You know, it, in part it makes my job tougher. In part, it just makes me less popular within the firm because <laughs> you know the truth is is that until we do a risk analysis of a service, we block the service, right? Um, and so. You know, our employees cannot go to the latest and greatest offering uh, until you know we've made a thoughtful decision as a firm that this is something we want to we want to use, and then we're going to do an analysis of it and say what are the security controls that they provide. You know, how comfortable are we with the service um, in combination with the risk of the information we're going to put on the service. Right? Not everything has to be protected at the highest level. You figure out you know what level of protection do you need, and then you look to get that level of protection. But in the meantime, uh, everybody uh, who wants to use the latest and greatest thing and goes to the, you know, say a website and finds that it's blocked by me and my team, uh, they love me. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess coming back, uh, you know, on the personalization topic, and and you kind of explain very clearly how uh, you can generate a lot of meaningful insights when it comes to leveraging big data. But in terms of just personalization and you know this whole debate around personalization versus privacy mm -hmm. how do you end up drawing a line okay this is where we are probably uh, kind of uh, encroaching on somebody's privacy and 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 so just maybe elaborate on the thought process when it comes to you know this uh, these two aspects well I'm I'm happy to and you guys should chime in here I'm sure you have good examples and experiences um, the um, so I don't think there's a perfect answer um, you have generational preferences, you have all kinds of things going on in terms of you know, sort of the consumer <coughs> expectations that moving up into the right, the sort of legal regulatory environment, particularly when you're you know, uh, operating in a company that, that is in 113 countries with you know, uh, nearly 6,000 you know, sort of retail endpoints. There are a lot of jurisdictional concerns. Um, you know, I, there are probably three or four things that have been really important uh, when, you know, to me, when I think about strategies around personalization and the privacy of the data that, that you know, we hold. The first is, um, you know, the right to pass go here is governance um, and sort of securing the environment. And y you only get the right as a company to sort of use the data if you can, if you can secure it, if you can lock it down. Uh, and so that, by the way, I think most companies think of that as, as sort of something run by your, you know, CISO. Um, I think of it as not just a technology uh, set of disciplines, but as a cultural thing in the company. Uh, and so it really does take stewards across the business and a re respect for data and a respect for consumer and what they care about and a knowledge and awareness and proximity to that, you know, sort of consumer sentiment. And if you don't have it, you should hold less data you, because, um, because your, your risk, both from a privacy standpoint and from a cyber standpoint, is directly related to how much data you, how much data you store. Um, so the first thing is you know, sort of governance and, and security and, and culturally an environment that, that supports that. Um, you know, the second thing I would say is you know, flexibility, right? One of the toughest things about the, da the data environment and the privacy environment is that preferences change over time. And so you have to acknowledge that and you have to build that in from the beginning. So architecturally and sort of from an engineering standpoint, you have to have really significant alignment in terms of where, you know, what you're storing, where you're storing at, what tier in the environment and how it's getting accessed um, and how it's going to be displayed and how you would control that because consumers at Hilton have the right to reach out to us and say, I want all my data deleted right now, right? Uh, and so we all have to respond to that. Um, so, so flexibility, you know, in the face of sort of changing consumer sentiment, changing, you know, regulation, sort of lots of jurisdictional uh, authorities, um, you know, to me says you have to be flexible. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is, um, 
you know, really focus on the benefit and the value that you're delivering with that data. It has a direct relationship to trust. And what I've found just, you know, from an experience standpoint is that consumers are more willing to share data with companies with whom they think they have an aligned value set, with whom they perceive real benefit in the offering and service when their data is used as part of the experience. And so um, focusing on the benefit you're promising to customers, I think, is, is uh, of paramount importance. Would you guys add anything to that? I, I have a couple of things I'd like to add. Ah. So one is that I think that, you know, sort of <laughs> you got to have um, uh, great data retention policies because if you don't have data, if you don't have data retention policies, <coughs> what do we all do? We keep everything forever, mm -hmm. and that is not in our not in our company's best interest, right? It's like you know, there's some things you just rather not have, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's uh, um, certainly uh, sort of one of the things that's top of mind um, for us. Um, and two is you know, sort of, you know, we. we I think it's great that you guys block things that aren't, aren't you know, sort of sanctioned by the firm, um, because otherwise people just sort of sign up for premium service, which we love. So we're not. We hope that if anybody in the room allows that, please continue to do so. Thank you. <laughs> um, but you know, there's always that little agreement at the end where you sort of click I agree, and then you know, and no one ever reads that. Reads that, right? Yep. And uh, and we were just sort of talking a few moments ago how. With a you know one of our clients, I shared some content uh, back to the CIO, and she was like blown away. It's like, how do you have all this data about my people? Well, they signed up for the free service, and it's like, and we're just sharing it with you. And uh, and you know, so that was kind of like an intellectually. Inter I wasn't sure if she was upset or just sort of amazed. Uh, you know, I'm not. So <laughs> I, I'm going with the amazed. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So I think, uh, and then the last point I'd like to make. Uh, um, is you know sort of when the when you think about the world's population of you know uh, millennials and, and Gen Z today, which are you know approaching five billion people, um, you know uh, they they uh, what do they, what do they think about sort of controls and privacy? They share things like they're an open book until something you know bad happens, and then they clam up, which is uh, fascinating to watch how an 18-year-old can go from being completely open to it's like not even, you know, sort of not answering the phone at all. It's like being scared to answer the phone. So, mm. but that's a private story. Which <laughs> 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 you know, the only thing I'd add is, is, and if I could leave you with one takeaway, it's this. If, if you're going to take advantage of data, put it in one place. Decide what you need. Yep. Put it in one place. Yep. Uh, and be thoughtful about how you secure it uh, and ultimately delete it when you no longer need it. Um, because going back to your point about the uh, the the requests for the information that you have, the request to delete it, the request to see it. Uh, you know, the colleagues I have that work at, at firms that have large legacy consumer businesses tend to have that data scattered all throughout the firm. And it's an incredibly challenging uh, proposition for them to pull that data together and give it back to the consumer with any confidence that they've gotten even 95% of the data. Um, so, you know, if you're starting down a path now, you have the opportunity to get it right, and that will pay massive dividends for you in the future. If you're inheriting, you know, that legacy situation I just described, there's nothing to do but chip away at the problem. You know, assemble the data over time, you know, ever more central, um, so that you have a better handle on it, and, and ultimately can better take advantage of it. Right? It's ex also extremely difficult to take to obtain the value from that data when it's scattered about. Yeah. I'd like to add to that. It's like it's a single source of truth. You get many different eyeballs looking at the data, yep. which is great. And also, when you think about sort of the myriad of a myriad of applications in the portfolio, mm -hmm. you can actually reduce the number of people yes. who have to have access to all of these because you can just have that <coughs> narrow focus to the set of data that they actually need to do their business. And that that in itself is very I powerful. Huge, 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 many. Yeah. And we spend a great, great deal of time talking and thinking, and appropriately so, around data that sort of has, you know, PII and you know, more sensitive elements to it. But um, causing organizations to sort of practice and, and develop muscles around anonymized data and the pattern detection that that is available <coughs> there, I think, is is a you know sort of noteworthy strategy as well. Um, yeah. No, that's payments good. data, et cetera. You know, so um, it looks like having controls is uh, paramount when it comes to big data strategy. Maybe it's a good time to take our poll. So the question for uh, the poll is, how would you describe your company's ability to draw the line on 
capturing relevant customer data and respecting privacy. And, okay, uh, it's real time, so I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, looks like... Uh, so I, I really think we have people debating how to much to disclose here. <laughs> I was debating how many CISOs yeah. we had in the audience. Yeah, fair enough. Guys guys yeah. I, I fair think they're enough. worried about all the data that they're giving away. Right that, that's right. Yeah, right. that's a very interesting result. I didn't expect that, but uh, okay. You are all yeah. phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, let me actually uh, go back to something that you alluded to and, uh, you know, the jurisdictions and the regulatory aspect. And Harry, maybe you could elaborate uh, on, on that. Given Zoom is a global company, you know, they have customers uh, in, in different parts where, you know, the and, and uh, we know in Europe uh, we have GDPR regulations now and looks like big tech is under scrutiny and it's slowly trickling down to all kind of you know, tech scrutiny. So yeah. any thoughts around how you are going about just the data residency requirements and just handling yeah. uh, GDPR? I think there's a, a huge movement in this space from a regulatory perspective. We look what's going on in this country. You know, it, it, uh, there was a whole other discussion that I was party to this afternoon where they were talking about sort of like how all the states are coming up with their own regulation. Why can't, you know, why can't we just have one to cover the nation? And uh, so they don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But who knows? Um, so it's uh, it's very real, and uh, I think it's uh, very material in terms of the impact that this is going to have and our ability to do business. So I remember in prior companies talking about sort of the content sharing. So if you know if you're in Germany and you're in Switzerland and I'm in the U.S., <coughs> like you know sort of where does the content you know who originates the content and where's the content stored? Yep. Is that you know if I share content with you, is that and uh, from the U.S. to Germany or to Switzerland, it's like, where, it, you know, where's the boundary for regulation now? Mm. Yep. So I think that's a, um, I think that's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing unfolds. I think that there's still a lot of learnings about it, at least that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. I don't think people have figured it out, but um, it's, uh, uh, it's a big concern, yeah. Okay. If you guys want to add to that, yeah. You know, the only thing I'd add is, is there's an analogy in the cybersecurity regulatory front, right, which is we've had an incredibly heterogeneous global set of cybersecurity regulations. Uh, I think we're very fortunate in the U.S. The U.S. regulators have done a great job of, of deciding to harmonize. Uh, the financial regulators have done a great job of deciding to harmonize around uh, certain finan you know, the NIST cybersecurity framework and a certain financial set on that. Um, I think that's amazing leadership by the U.S. regulators, and I'm hoping that they can drive that globally. Uh, you know, I think we have similar challenges with data localization laws, um, you know, which require you to keep your data in different jurisdictions. Um, I think we're uh, probably further behind uh, as a world in trying to sort of shape that regime to one that will really support the economic environment that we want in the 21st century, um, but it's something that we have to tackle. And, and just to kind of piggyback on that, so we Obviously, we are capturing a lot more data. That's universal for every company out there. But when it comes to cyber threats, they are becoming more and more sophisticated. You keep hearing about all different types of attacks. And every time the technique used is very different from the previous attack. So like given you know your role at, uh, and, and I, I was wondering if you could talk to us, you know, in terms of how you are thinking about the changing nature of attacks and, and kind of tie that with the big data strategy that uh, your company is deploying. Yeah, uh, you know, if I'm ever invited to give a speech on April 1st, I'm looking forward to saying that, the, you know, this year the cyber threat environment <laughs> is less scary than it was last year. Uh, because I think that's the only opportunity I'll ever get. Every year is worse. Um, you know, malicious actors are becoming more aggressive, more destructive. <laughs> Um, you know, at the same time, I do think there's, there's room for optimism. Um, I think we are seeing um, more and more companies get a handle on how to manage risk in this space. Certainly not enough, and nobody's perfect, um, but I think we are seeing an improvement in the ability of companies to defend themselves. Now we need to see that more broadly disseminated. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, it, it, I, for me, the last, uh, you know, major breakpoint in this space came from the, uh, the NotPetya attack about two years ago. Um, I've seen all the, the worst cybersecurity attacks. You know, I, I spent four years in the Obama White House uh, as the Senior Director for Cybersecurity, some time in Homeland Security, the Department of Defense. 
I've been in the space uh, since the late 90s, and so I've, you know, I've had a seat at the table to discuss the most significant, impactful, and scary attacks um, that we've seen. Um, and, and really, that not Petya attack to me was, um, was really significant in the evolution of risk in this space because ultimately, you know, what happened uh, was uh, some, some threat actor, uh, widely believed by the cybersecurity community to be, to be the Russian government, um, targeted Ukraine uh, and essentially released uh, malware to, uh, through the software update mechanism of Ukraine tax accounting software. So if you're a company in Ukraine, you use this tax accounting software um, to file your taxes. Um, it, got a, it got a patch, but that patch was malicious. Um, and it caused computer, you know, it spread throughout your network and destroyed data uh, wherever, you know, wherever it reached. What was fascinating about that was it was essentially unconstrained. We've seen previous data destruction attacks, but those were, were attacks where uh, you know, a, a threat actor got onto somebody's network. Consciously, a human at the keyboard moved around computer to computer and spread, and then decided to destroy the data across whatever subset of computers, generally targeted at one company. This attack, there was nobody, you know, nobody in the driver's seat. It was entirely automated. It didn't, you know, whoever created it didn't ultimately care where it went. Um, and so it had, you know, it had a lot of, of bystanders uh, damaged as a result. Um, and you know, from my perspective, thinking globally about the risk picture, picture here, that was a terrible outcome, right? That was a step from um, I'm willing to do highly aggressive things to one victim that I'm focused on to I'm willing to, you know, do highly aggressive things and I don't care who gets hurt by it. Um, you know, both are bad. One of them, from a societal perspective, is even scarier. Um, and, and so, you know, we have this tension, right, because in the world we want to take, adva we take advantage of data, take advantage of all that uh, information technology can offer us. We want more connectedness, more openness. At the same time, there's this countervailing trend in my world where we have to, to some degree, lock down to avoid this kind of attack. Got it. Since you have a few minutes left, uh, I thought uh, we could touch on the talent aspect, or, you know, of just kind of deploying big data as well as rolling out, you know, a strategy to protect it. I mean, is that something that you kind of find it challenging when it comes to uh, thinking about uh, security and, and big data in tandem is talent something? With regard to the availability yeah, of data is yeah. what you mean. Yeah, raise your hand if, if you don't have a problem with scarcity of talent in, you know, sort of the advanced engineering, machine learning, data science, discipline because we should talk yeah, I was about to say, we're, we're going to come get your card I would really uh, I would like <coughs> to know you know sort of what you guys are doing <laughs> um, you know I you know I think it, it's a little bit of an arms race you know sort of type of uh, I, I I think the value proposition that you offer the uh, you know sort of transformational capability I think is a, is a really big uh, deal how your company and the culture of your company feels about that talent is a really important you know, sort of characteristic. And so I would be very, very clear about the story um, and, and the truth of the story for, for this you know, sort of scarce resource set and, and I think try to create a partnership. Um, but it's increasingly, it's increasingly scarce, right? And so even more reason to store less data, only the data you need, to govern it appropriately, to, right? So, um, to find the high leverage areas, to focus on finding talent that has experience in those particular areas, so something like pricing or something like, you know, sort of a retail physical, physical experience, um, because then those folks can have access to make really impactful uh, difference and change in the environment. And so I, I think your strategy with regard to you know, both finding and keeping this talent over time has a lot to do with those elements. Um, but it, it's a difficult thing. What do you guys, do you guys? Well, so given that we are, you know, a tech startup and an eight-year-old tech startup that went public earlier this year, um, uh, and, you know, a lot of, you know, so a lot of tech um, resources who really want to come and work at Zoom. Uh, why? Because, you know, we have a great culture. We have a really cool product. People love the company, and so and and the other part of that is that we didn't have a lot of legacy. Yep. So we don't. We just Dragging like we a boat no, anchor is not what you're doing. We're not. <laughs> no, no, we, you know, we have no on-prem. We have nothing on-prem at all anywhere. Um, and uh, so our data repository, when we first started building it, there, there was nothing to it. It was, mm -hmm. you know, and so 
you know, so our data science team, if you will, sort of started with like a person. And we've been, you know, we, we recruit from, you know, college, you know, from universities. And uh, so we're, we're able to sort of like expand that team in a nice organic fashion that's growing, like the company is growing. And uh, so I wouldn't say we don't have a problem, um, uh, but it's, uh, it's a, I think it's, a, you know, it's sort of when I go back to my days like at KPMG or Blackstone as an example, it's like, yeah, sort of, you know, that was usually different challenges trying to recruit people into mm -hmm. those organizations. They're great organizations for sure, but you know, you've got geographics, you've got sort of like, what am I going to be working on? It's kind of like, is this a cool product? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is an accounting firm. Oh, it's an audit. It's kind of like, you know, audit is not the... Any auditors in the room? <coughs> okay, good. Um, audit is not sort of like, there's nothing really cool about auditing software, right? But, uh. I, I mean, I, what I find fascinating now, you know, I've had to deal with this workforce uh, problem in, in multiple firms, as, as you both have. Um, and, you know, right now we're really well postured, right? We've got uh, a quarter of Goldman Sachs, our engineers. Um, you know, we have really exciting problems that we work at at scale, and, and you know, I think we, we can change the world. Um, that's a, you know, that's a powerful selling proposition, and we've got a lot going for us. It's still hard to find the, the type of person that we want to hire. You know, when I worked in the government, um, I could offer you terrible hours, lots of red tape, uh, and low, low pay to accompany it. Um, <laughs> but I could also you know, offer you the, the ability to really have an impact on your nation and, and to serve your country. And, and you know, That's a big I've got proposition. amazing people as a result who put up with incredibly horrible things yeah. um, <laughs> and, you know, in order to contribute to their nation. And, and you know, you, I think your point was you, you have to find what is that crux of your, your selling proposition and, and you know, really help people understand what it is. That has to be excited. true throughout the culture. I think the other thing is you have to be willing to develop. I think yeah. people are often, yeah. you know, often say to me, well, in a transformation, you know, don't you have to go get all of these new skills and isn't that the hardest part of the job? And I, you know, my experience has been 85% is generally going to be the people you already have and 15% will be new. And so you better be willing yeah. to hire leader teachers to take, you know, to help those folks develop because people really want to. And it's a huge, it's well, a huge selling proposition. It's a huge va uh, advantage for them. It's, it's, a, it's so motivational for mm -hmm. your incumbent staff. If you, if, you know, I remember this at Credit Suisse where we were, shutting down legacy systems and, you know, people, big, big IBM mainframe skills and COBOL, but then you teach them about distributed and, you know, those times I think it was like C we were teaching them or something. Um, yeah. And, uh, and when, the, when people see that you are actually going to invest and take them off the line and send them to yeah. get educated in new tech skills because they have the subject matter expertise, they Context. understand yeah. the business. Right. And to be able to, if you're an asset, you know, building asset-backed trading systems, it's like I can come back and like do that in a distributed environment. This is cool, right? Yeah. This is like really good. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our panelists.